this barn so full of people really eager to listen to some really great stuff. Um, my name is Kim Nealand, and I'm the Community Engagement Manager here at Wright Lock Farm. I'm also the organizer of the speaker series. Um, and again, I just want to thank you all for coming. This is our fourth session of the speaker series in 2017. And uh, there's just it's just really energizing to see so many people here on a Wednesday night just, you know, wanting to learn and soak up some knowledge. So I just wanted to kind of take a moment and really appreciate where we are right here. Basically, by the end of the night, we should have, uh, there should be about 90 people here in this beautiful historic barn. And, you know, a lot of you came in for the paper plate supper, which for those of you who just came in, uh, you wouldn't have noticed, but there were tables and chairs laid out in the front of the barn. And about two hours ago, this was classroom space, or probably a couple more hours than that, it was classroom space for our education programs. This barn is literally being just it's in transition. It's kind of a choreography that uh, our education director over there, Rebecca, me, and Amy over there with our uh, events do all the time. If any of you guys have been here throughout the month of September, you know that this space is, you know, it transitions from a classroom to a dance hall, to a lecture space, to a yoga studio, to a museum, and to a community dining hall. It's you know, and you've probably seen all of us, the staff, running around trying to make that happen. Um, the farm is such a unique place and it's so full of opportunities and more and more people are discovering how special, how really special this place is and they're wanting to get involved. And we couldn't be more excited about what this farm can and will be able to do for our community. Um, but with all this community demand on top of the fact that we cannot operate this farm year round because this barn can't be heated, um, we basically are running at maximum capacity in terms of our facilities and our staff. And while we want to be able to keep sharing the space with our community and make it accessible for those who really need this space as a resource um, and uh, provide the educational opportunities that a working farm can provide, uh, we're newly, we're bar embarking on a new phase, this farm. So I'm really excited to say that we're, starting a new campaign to build a new education center here at the farm and so that Wrightlock Farm can play an even bigger role in cultivating uh, our future. We have a bit of information about the building um, at that front table that you're at, so if you are at all interested um, in getting involved in any kind of way, definitely take that on your way out. Um, and there's a lot of other information about the farms and all of the programs going on here. But again, it's just such a vibrant and exciting community to be part of, and I feel really lucky to be. So we're we're getting really, really jazzed about what, what this farm can keep on doing um, and, and become. But back to tonight, I want to turn our attention um, to our amazing speaker, uh, Tim Griffin, who is an associate professor at the Friedman School of Nutrition Science and Policy at Tufts University. Since 2009, he's been the director of the Agriculture, Food, and the Environment program. He holds a PhD in crops and soil science from Michigan State University, and for the last 27 years, he's been deeply involved in researching and teaching about sustainable agriculture, the environment, soils, and the development of sustainable production systems. It's no question today that Tim has a wealth of knowledge and experience, and we are so lucky to have him here with us today. So without further ado, I'm going to welcome him to the floor, and please join me. Thank you, Tim. Um, th I appreciate the invitation from Wrightlock. Um, we live actually pretty near here. This is like the closest farm to our house, so we walk through here a lot. Um, very familiar with what's going on here at the farm, so it's a it's a pleasure to be here. It's been a, a kind of an interesting day. Um, I started my day. I have some students that are actually here tonight that are uh, gluttons for punishment, apparently, because we spent a lot of time together this morning uh, talking about something totally different than genetic engineering. We were talking about a very consequential period for agriculture and policy in our country around the Great Depression and the Dust Bowl, which it's like I can't imagine something more different than what I'm going to talk about right now. Um, so I'm, I'm going to address this topic of genetic engineering and agriculture and um, 
So we're, we're from the Midwest. My wife Janice is right in the front row, ready to ask questions. So, um, and, and we have a saying there that it's, it's not our first rodeo. Um, so I've given lots of talks around, uh, it, some in a public forum like this, but uh, when the first genetically engineered crops came on the market in a big way in the late 1990s, I actually worked for Cooperative Extension at that point, so was like working day to day with farmers who were trying to make decisions about whether this technology is fundamentally different from some other technologies that they had developed, or is it just kind of another technology? Did it fit into their production system and all of those kinds of things? And to just to kind of give you a little bit of feeling for where I come from on this, I think the the presence of genetically engineered products in agriculture is often viewed as kind of transformational um, technology. I don't actually, personally, my own personal thought on that is I don't actually think that. I think it's more incremental than anything. Um, and, and I also have a lot of respect for how the, the producers out there on farms have to think about this technology and other technologies. So um, I'll, that will kind of go through my talk. I'm not, I'm not in any way here to convince people that this is the right way or the wrong way to produce our food and fiber and fuel and all of those types of things. Um, so, and I, occasionally people say, uh, Tim, you're a little too balanced in your presentations. Uh, you can, you know, ask questions and we'll, we'll talk about it. Um, but I, it, it's something I'm very interested in. What I'm going to summarize today is in 2014, 15, and early 16, I served on a, 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 what they call a study committee at the National Academy of Sciences that was on genetically engineered crops in agriculture, but a very different kind of study because it was um, not, we, we didn't focus just on the US, uh, we didn't focus just on what was happening in kind of the current moment. We looked backwards, but we also looked forwards. We looked at policy, we looked at regulation, all of those kinds of things. So I'm gonna, part of what I'm gonna do is summarize what we, um, the, the conclusions that we drew as a committee. And I'll try to be clear about when I'm talking about the results of the committee deliberations versus when I'm talking about what my own personal thoughts on this are. Um, th they're mostly congruent, but, but maybe not entirely, but I'm happy to expand on things as we go through. Now I just have to remember how we do this. Here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna just, um, I wanna be clear on terminology um, about what we mean when we talk about genetic engineering or GMOs and those kinds of things. Um, I'll go into some detail just to um, illustrate to you which products in our food supply, but also um, outside of our food supply. For example, cotton is really not uh, a food, even though we use cottonseed oil, but um, there, most cotton in the U.S. and in a lot of other places is genetically engineered. Um, so I'll illustrate that, and then I'll at least summarize some of the major parts of the National Academies report. And some thoughts on like, where are we? Things are changing. Those of you that you know, follow anything to do with this, uh, things are changing at a really remarkable pace right now with things like gene editing, um, those CRISPR and those kinds of things, and I'll circle back to that at the end. So um, the, the terminology is various and it, it has kind of evolved over time. So if, you, if I would have given this talk you know, as recently maybe as three or four years ago, I would have said what we should be talking about is transgenic organisms, where you take a gene from an unrelated organism and you move it into something else. So it's a, it, it is a transfer of genetic material. Um, that's no longer uh, strictly true. Um, genetic, genetically engineered organism is actually the terminology that the National Academy study adopted. I actually prefer that. Um, Genetic GMO or genetically modified um, has been maybe the primary term out in the public discourse, the conversation around this, and I'm okay with that. Um, USDA in some cases, this is kind of an old phrase. They will still occasionally refer to them as biotech crops coming out of 25, 30 years ago. We 
referred to molecular biology as biotechnology. Um, but my, my, I, I'll, I'll fairly consistently use this terminology tonight. And um, what I mean by that is that we're manipulating things at the level of genetic material versus I'm just selecting so that um, this uh, wheat plant uh, is stronger, has a stronger stem and doesn't fall over in the wind, but I'm selecting that as a characteristic where with genetic engineering, we're actually operating at the level of DNA and RNA. Um, and, and it's changed a little bit whether we actually move genes or not, but I'll, I'll come back to that later. So, so it's, it's somewhat my kind of practical definition that I operate under um, when I say genetic engineering. Some of them are transgenic, some of them are not. So the available genetically engineered crops, I want to just kind of give you a run through here of what is out there, some of which are very obvious to people. Everybody knows that they're out there and some maybe that you might be a little bit surprised, but the list is not very long. I think it's when I say available, I mean they're commercially available. Farmers can buy seeds, and when you buy products in the grocery store and elsewhere, they are coming from genetically engineered crops. So I'm thinking it available in the commercial sense, okay? Um, and I will, I'll focus most 99.5% of my time focusing on crops because that's really the only agricultural products that are currently commercially available and genetically engineered. That is starting to change. There was some preliminary approvals given for um, a genetically engineered salmon uh, a year or so ago, but I think it's a ways from commercial availability. So I will, and I'm, I'm a crops person, I'm an agronomist, so I'm more comfortable talking about crops anyway. Um, so I will, I will focus on those kinds of things. So there's categories. So farmers in the US and worldwide use chemicals to control weeds. They also use other strategies to control weeds. So it's not exclusive. There are multiple strategies. So we have genetically engineered crops that are tolerant of major um, herbicides, weed killers out in the agricultural landscape. And the way they did this is they found a gene in a microbe, in a bacteria in the soil, and they plucked it out and they put it into corn and soybeans and things like that. And it's, um, it's, a very, it's actually a very subtle change that allows those plants now to be tolerant of that particular herbicide. And, and this is uh, glyphosate, uh, sold under the trade name of Roundup, is now the most widely used pesticide in the United States uh, by, by some distance. Uh, but it was also widely used before these products came out, which a lot of people don't realize. It was widely used even in the 1980s. And what it allows is, uh, this is corn. Uh, we talk about corn a lot, um, good and bad and ugly, but anyway. Um, and what it allows the farmer to do is plant corn, and then this is all weeds. Let it come up, let it get that tall, six, eight inches tall. Uh, come out, spray it all at once. The weeds are susceptible the corn is not. So, and the corn is not because it has that gene that was moved into it. Pretty straightforward. This was developed originally probably in the late 1980s, but didn't actually reach the market in a major way until 1996, 97, and 98. So uh, about 20 years ago. These are the crops. So, uh, corn and soy, major crops in the United States, that would total some 150 million acres between those two. Cotton, much smaller. Canola, which is a mustard, it's an oil seed. Um, alfalfa, this one's relatively new and not as widely used. And then sugar beets, which almost every sugar beet grown in the United States is genetically engineered for herbicide tolerance. So, um, so this is one category. And this is, you'll see a theme here. These are what we would refer to as input traits. So they are traits that influence the way that we actually grow the crop. So they think of them as farmer-directed traits. Um, farmers can adopt it, and then they shift their production strategies to take advantage of this. Okay, so that's one category. Then we have insect resistance. 
also a gene from a microbe. It's actually a small family of genes because they're not all identical. It's from this bacteria, which we just refer to as Bt. And um, the Bt organism exists naturally. Uh, and a long time ago, it was figured out how to uh, uh, produce the protein and then spray it on crops. So this is a very widely used um, pesticide in organic agriculture. But what they're doing is they're spraying on this protein. What the GE did is it, they moved the gene into corn and cotton and things like that. So the plant produces the protein. And it, when insects eat the material, it kills them. And it kills them because the protein crystallizes in their gut. So BT we've known about, I think, since the 1930s. Um, they came onto the market at the same time, in roughly 96, 97, 98, in a set of crops. So this is um, a larva that uh, is chewing on this leaf. And if this leaf was a BT crop, then for a, it's, a, it's a fairly specific range of insects that are susceptible to this. So it's not every bug in the world. And it's not every bug at every life stage. It's more specific than that. And, and these are the crops. Again, corn was on the other list. Cotton, these have been around now for 20 years. There's, th this is, you know, in production. It'll be here before long. Um, but also eggplant is another one. Uh, there was some work in the 90s around um, BT potatoes. And the, the, the company eventually just pulled it from the market because there was enough pushback from uh, not only consumers but other groups because we think of potatoes much more as a food crop, something that we would sit down at our kitchen table and eat, than soybeans, right? So it became, it, it was it's like much more connected to our actual food supply whereas Corn and soy end up in a thousand different things like soy oil and all of those types of things. So, um, so this is another another category. Oops, another category um, is insect resistance. Okay, also an input trait, right? It's it alters the way that farmers grow certain things, but that's not a very long list of crops. And you know, if you walk through the produce aisle of the grocery store or the farmers market, it's possible that you might see, and it wouldn't, as you probably all know, it wouldn't be labeled, but it, there, there might be eggplant, but then all of these other things are part of the food supply, but they're also part of the industrial supply. Cotton in the clothing, and corn gets partitioned into many industrial products, so it's not that it all ends up in the food supply. Um, disease resistance, you see the trend, right? This is another resistance strategy. This one is interesting though, because one, this doesn't get near the press that things like Roundup Ready corn and soy get. Um, and it's an unusual mix of crops. And they've been around for a long time. These are not new, um, but they're also not obvious. And I'll give you an idea. If you buy a papaya that comes from Hawaii, it's almost certainly genetically engineered and has been for a couple of decades. And the, the trait that it's um, engineered to be resistant to is this, and this is um, uh, the uh, papaya um, ring spot virus. So it's, it, it's a viral disease. It doesn't necessarily kill the papaya, but nobody's gonna buy papaya that looks like this. This was developed actually in the early 90s it essentially saved the papaya industry in Hawaii. If they hadn't have had this, the industry would have disappeared. It was developed um, partly through Cornell University. So again, very um, predominant use of this for the production of that crop in Hawaii. Not necessarily elsewhere, but certainly in Hawaii. The, the cucurbits, things like squash, um, different types of squash. Uh, it, it's not 100%, it's probably something more like 10 or 20% is genetically engineered to be resistant to certain um, viruses that influence uh, leaves. Like this, this is the symptoms. 
it, probably like a leaf roll virus. That's actually what they're called. Um, and then one that, uh, this is an interesting one. This is plums. And, and this, is, uh, this is plum pox. And, uh, you know, you don't, people are not going to buy this either. This is an interesting one, though. So it was developed, but it has not been released into commercial availability in the United States because plum pox is actually not a dominant disease in the United States. It, but it is on the northern shore of Lake Ontario in Canada. And they, they're, gonna, they're like holding it until they actually need it, which is a very different strategy than most other genetically engineered crops. It's like, you know, we paid millions of dollars to develop and get this approved, and we're going to put it out in the market right away. They're in 